Hi, everybody. I'm Alicia. Um, I'm here to give you a rundown on how to survive in design programs and just in general, how to kind of function around design softwares as well as your file formats. Um, all the fun things that hopefully by the end of this, you have a general knowledge where you can function in programs and you can spend less money on artists and graphic designers. Do a little bit yourselves. So I'll just kind of jump on in. Um, who am I? I'm Alicia Bokeman. Um, I am a game designer. I'm also an artist, an illustrator, and graphic design occasionally uh, if need be. Um, I designed a game called Underlings of Underwing. Uh, you may see War Torn if you're going to Proto Spill later. Um, Zambies was the very first game I've ever made. And then uh, Minion Mayhem was a game I did. And then these are some games. I don't know, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, perfect. Um, Parkies was actually one of the first big games I did for someone else, uh, JT specifically. Uh, Beasts is on Kickstarter currently, and the bottom two were recently on Kickstarter, both funded successfully. So uh, that's what I do, mostly day to day, just helping other people do their board game stuff, right? Uh, disclaimer, <laughs> everyone does things differently. Uh, there's rarely one right answer, and don't be afraid to try new things. So just because I tell you to do something doesn't mean you can't try another way, learn something a new way, watch a YouTube video. Always try new things and find your way. This is just how I do things. So. Uh, free programs. No one wants to drop 50 bucks a month on Adobe Suites. So there are free, well, <laughs> unless you're me, right? Um, but there are free programs out there. These are just a couple, but there are hundreds. Um, some basic ones that a lot of people use that I know of, uh, GIMP and Paint.net. Um, they're simple, but they're pretty powerful. They can do what you need without all the extra bells and whistles. Uh, there's Krita, which is, think of it like a clone of Photoshop. Um, not necessarily as powerful, but it's pretty powerful. It's also a lot to take in if you're new to design programs. So maybe start with the top few. Uh, and then Inkscape, which is a vector-based program. Uh, good if you're doing like custom punch outs for the game crafters, uh, vector, vector scalable art. Um, again, it has a little bit of a learning curve if you've never used a vector program, um, but it's still pretty neat. It's worth, a check, worth checking it out. When you're going for a free program, because you don't have to, of course, use these ones, there's a couple things you look for in your free programs. It needs to have layers. If it doesn't have layers, don't use it. Uh, layers allow you to easily edit your files. Uh, you can move things around. You can change colors. They give you freedom. And they don't restrict you if you need to go back and re-edit your designs. So it has to have layers. Of course, text. If your program doesn't have text, how are you going to add anything to it? So always make sure that it has text. Uh, shape creation is a plus. Uh, if you want to add a if you want to add a box, if you want to add a circle, shape creation, um, color correction. Um, you don't necessarily need this, but it's a nice bonus. Um, if you're printing with the Game Crafter, you might need to brighten your images a bit before you have them printed. Um, let's say you have an icon that's blue, but now you want it to be red. Color correction will easily change that for you without having to reach out to your artist. Um, and then masks. And I have a couple examples of some of these features. Uh, I'm going to be using Photoshop, but you can get these in a lot of other programs. Uh, the first example I'm going to be showing you guys are masks and how masks work. Uh, so for example, I have three files here. Uh, these ones over here are going to be coins that I have actual files set out for, for print. Um, but let's say you want to use these as an example image on a card or on your box. You want to be able to cut that out, but maybe not ruin your image. What a mask allows you to do is get rid of that background without ruining your image. And what it does is you can fit it to a specific shape. Right underneath these is just circles, circle shapes. Another example of this is if you have a, something like this. And what I said about how it doesn't ruin your base image, I can move this image around. It's still all there but you're not losing it. So this is why masks are important. You could have a character here and cut it out to the shape of your layout and you don't have to worry about, oh no, I cut it, but I need to move it and now I have a ruined image I have to start from scratch. Nope, you just move it. So this is why masks are important. Most good programs have them, even free ones. And then of course, color correction. This is a, like a magic ball, it's purple. But let's say you don't want it to be purple. Let's say you want it orange. You can do that easily with color corrections as well as removing the color completely and making them bright. So that's why that's important in your programs. Of course, a lot of these are just fun, fancy functions. You don't necessarily need them, but they're good ones to look out for. 
paid programs. These are, of course, going to be your cream of the crop programs, the ones that your professionals are going to be using. Um, it's worth picking up a trial and learning them because then you'll know what your artist is using, you'll know what your graphic designer is using. Um, but as well as most free programs will open Adobe save files. So you're not necessarily locked down to using these if your artist or graphic designer is using them. For example, GIMP, Krita, um, a program I use called Clip Studio Paint, they all open these types of files. Um, now with paid programs, there's different ones for different jobs. Photoshop, it's your powerful all around tool. It's good for almost anything, but it's not perfect at one job. Uh, InDesign is another Adobe program. Uh, I use it for mainly booklet, booklets, excuse me, and also putting together cards in specific manners, and I'll get into that in a moment here. Of course, Component Studio, uh, JT's baby. Uh, I love Component Studio. I use it for my print and plays. I use it for a lot of different games. It's great. Uh, Illustrator, I don't use it as often as most other people do. I use it mostly just for custom punch outs, um, but a lot of people do everything in Illustrator, which is a valid option. But just think about it, you have tons of options. You're not locked down to one program. Pros and cons of, of some of these softwares. So Pro Photoshop and Photoshop-like tools, and you guys can jump in with questions. Just be like, Alicia, slow down, or Alicia, I have a question. Because I don't know if I'm going to take up a full hour. So <laughs> I'm, you guys, it's up to you guys to ask me questions and take up time. <laughs> um, so Photoshop is a powerful tool. Uh, it's versatile, great for template creation. It's great for your board games and boxes. However, if you have a ton of cards you want to create, uh, if you have um, a booklet, it's not the best program. It can do it, but it's not great, it's not convenient, and it's definitely not fast. Uh, InDesign and Component Studio-like tools, they're amazing for doing a ton of files. Um, they're horrible if you want to do a box. They're horrible if you want to do a board, or even a play, uh, maybe a player reference in InDesign, but generally you want these for doing a ton of files or a booklet, uh, not in Component Studio. Don't do booklets in Component Studio. <laughs> you can do booklets in InDesign, um, but it's good for doing a lot of files. Um, and these are the programs that I use mainly. Uh, Clip Studio Paint is what I draw in. I do all my design work in there. Um, if I need to create an image, it's all done there. I drop everything into Photoshop for layout, uh, putting my card design together, um, creating my boards, creating my boxes. InDesign I always use for my rule books um, and sometimes putting certain types of cards together. And then Component Studio when I have to do a ton of similar cards. Um, when it comes to Photoshop, this is something Photoshop is great at. This is a custom punch out, uh, not for the GameCrafter, this is for um, Long Pack, uh, printer in China. This is, they gave me the template. I had the uh, files put together, and basically, everything in red is something that gets cut out separately. Ooh, I got blinded by the projector. <laughs> um, and so Photoshop is great at dropping in other components into Photoshop to make a bigger file. This is what Photoshop stars at. This is what Component Studio is a star at. In these, everything in here gets swapped out. The glow around the bottom of the cards, Component Studio swaps that out for me depending on the card type. The text, Component Studio swaps that out for me. The main image, the numbers, the icons, the subtext, Component Studio switches all of that out for me automatically based on that data set which you guys saw earlier. It's amazing for making things like this. However, InDesign is good for things like this, where it's just basic text, but the text needs to be changed independently on each card, because some cards have battle questions which have the specific title only on certain cards. It's gonna change based on how long the question is. Some, are, some uh, cards have center-lined text and some don't, and sometimes a long answer has to be switched to a different column based on the thing. Yeah, Dusty? Yes. Uh, depending on what files I'm given. This was a thousand cards I had to do like this, and they gave me a Word document instead of like a spreadsheet. Um, <laughs> so data merge was a little harder. Data merge worked really well for importing a lot of other things I needed for it. Um, and if you guys don't know what data merge is, imagine Component Studio, that data set they use. It's like that, but it functions in Photoshop and InDesign kind of similarly, um, where it imports everything using code um, not nearly as many features as Component Studio, but still pretty similar. Um, but in this case, I had to manually edit every card because of the way they gave me the files. But that's why InDesign's great. It made it quick. I could just pop through each card. 
And InDesign will save everything together in one long PDF for me, where in Photoshop, I'd have to save everything independently. So that's why InDesign was good for that one. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Now, before we jump into our programs, templates, this is where you start. Your manufacturer, where you're getting stuff printed, should give you templates. If they don't, ask them for them. Any good printer should have their own templates. Uh, the first one here, the Game Crafters. I think anybody here probably knows what that looks like. The next one over I got from Long Pack. The reason they're important, the gray area is your bleed. The, uh, <clears throat> the red line is where they're gonna cut your file, and the blue is your safe zone. Now what all that means is, and JT went over this a little bit, uh, anything in that dotted line is safe. It's not gonna get cut off your card, because no matter where you're printing, you're bound to get drift. And if you get drift, anything in that bleed area is going to move into the card, and anything outside that blue dotted line could get cut off. So that's why that's important. Always follow templates. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, let's say they don't give you a template and you need to design your own. Templates follow very simple guidelines. You have the size of your card, so if your card is 2.5 by 3.5 inches, or if you're printing in another country, millimeters, 63 by 88. Um, <clears throat> they all follow very similar guidelines. The margin, or that safe zone, is always 1 eighth of an inch in, all around. And then 1 eighth of an inch out for your bleed. Or 3 millimeters, excuse me. <coughs> so, if you follow those, you need to make your own it's not too hard, but there's also a trick. Watch this. You go to Panda's website. Panda General Manufacturing or Panda GM. They have a template generator. <coughs> Let's say I want a two-piece box. I want it to be Puerto Rico sized. And I want it two, mil two millimeters thickness. Bam. See how fast the internet is here. Oh, that's not too bad. <clears throat> there you go. I now have a front and back template. Here's my preset up. There we go. So I have a template. That easy. You don't have to use that company if they don't give it to you. Panda has them all there for free. So it's a neat little trick. Uh, I have the website <coughs> right here if you want to write it down. Once that goes away. It's at the bottom of the page. <coughs> Everybody got it? Who wants it? I'll have it if anybody wants it later as well. Yeah. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, let me show you. Uh, so for in this case, usually when they give it to you, it's in a PDF, so most programs can read it. Um, it's also when you drop it in, it doesn't have a background, so it overlays really easily. So I would generally, in this case, I put a white background in, and then I would drop my art underneath it. It helped I wasn't drawing in yellow or in white, huh? So then I can still see the template underneath it, or the template over it. And this is how I would normally do it, so that way I can always see what I'm working on and where I'm safe to go and where I'm safe not to go. I always recommend dropping directly on this because when you save it, you can save it in the exact file size they gave to you, which will work with their pre-press. That's, that's, yeah. So that's also a thing is when they provide you a template, generally you provide that template right back to them. <coughs> a lot of them will actually ask for it back to make sure you were using it. <laughs> um, so with templates, the reason you follow them is drift. This is what normal drift looks like. Perfectly centered, everything's perfect, slightly off kilter. When designing for drift, there is the, I guess the big argument of whether to use borders or not using borders. 
A lot of people like the black borders. A lot of people say don't use them because of drift. In general, I'm always on the team of prepare for drift. It may not happen, it may happen. I prefer the open designs. It doesn't mean I don't use borders. I've used borders before, both of these are my designs. Um, and even if you design against drift, you don't use any borders, you can still sometimes notice it, depending on what's on your card. So do what's comfortable for you. It's kind of the way I go for it. Use them if you want to use them, but be prepared on what you're doing. For example, borders, you get those clean edges, all your cards are uniform, and that thing where if you stack the cards and you look slightly down, you can see all the colors, you can avoid that. <clears throat> of course, if you don't have borders, drift is less noticeable. The edges, uh, you get your art goes all the way to the edges, so you have all this pretty, you know, you don't lose your art. You have everything there. But of course, you can sometimes see that color on the edges. Now, when you're creating your files, generally, if they give you the templates, you don't have to worry too much about this. However, just in case, things you want to check on when you open them in your programs. Your DPI, or pixels per inch, or dots per inch, needs to be at 300 at least. Some places will ask for 150 minimum. I always say always go for 300. Um, I don't, yeah, I see your face. You're like, what? I had someone who wanted a banner, a banner created at 150. It was, I'm like, oh, it's going to be 300. Um, <clears throat> this is basically telling you how much information is in each inch of your document. Because we're in America, we're going to be using inches mostly today. So um, there is, in one inch, at 300 DPI, there's 300 pixels. Generally, a lot of documents will open up at like 72 pixels per inch, which is like your bare minimum. Always go for 300, more detail. It's going to print prettier. It's going to look better. <clears throat> also, when you're doing your file sizes, make sure you include your bleed. And then also make sure that um, you always use what's supplied. If they supply you one or if they have one, always use it. You go outside that, they aren't going to check. They will print whatever you give them. And you don't want to drop, you know, if you're printing in China and you're buying 2,000 copies, you don't want to buy 2,000 copies of a game that's printed wrong. So always use it provided. And then CMYK, which we're going to get into a bit now, you always want to design in CMYK or cyan, magenta, yellow, and key. Our key is black. Uh, this is what all printers use. Uh, yeah. Right, not, not like your megabytes or your gigabytes, right. <laughs> yep, like uh, 8 inches by 10 inches, the, the, the size of your canvas. Um, and then CMYK, and then, of course, you convert when needed, which we'll get into here. Color modes. This is very important. So there's two basic color, I guess you could say modes, in general. <clears throat> CMYK, which is what your printer uses, it's those four cartridges in your printer and red, green, blue, which is what your monitor uses to view stuff. Excuse me. You guys don't be talking too much today. <clears throat> Generally, it's for web, um, but you'll notice the Game Crafter will accept your red, green, blues only, and then they convert it back to CMYK. Why that's important is if you start in CMYK and they convert it and then they convert it back, it'll look better if you start in CMYK. Now, <clears throat> Panda, Long Pack, The Game Crafter. These are their color profiles. It's a measurement on how, on the differences between their four colors and how they print. Every printer, even your one at home, has a different color profile. How it applies each color. This top one up here is Long Packs. This is Pandas, this is The Game Crafters. Game Crafters has there for download. The other ones, should be available in your programs already. They basically just tell you how Panda is going to print your stuff and how to make sure your colors are applied correctly. So that way what the color you see is what the color they get when they print. When you're saving your files as PDFs when you're printing for China or anywhere else other than the game crackers usually, you want to make sure you save in their color profile or else your colors won't look the way you think they should look. <clears throat> Uh, so the color profile should already be installed on your machines. Uh, usually they already have them pre-built in. Um, 
<coughs> excuse me, um, with the color profiles, ask the printer if they don't tell you up front what theirs is. Um, places like Panda and Longpack, um, they, and I think What's gives you a booklet you can download online that has their color profile listed so you know which one to select. So that's important. Game Crafters doesn't tell you up front. You have to find it buried in their help section. <laughs> yeah? Right, some will provide it for you. Yep, and your computer will know how to read it. Literally, you like double click it and say install color profile. Yep, just like how you install a front. Your computer knows how to do it. Hey, Dusty, what's up? Nope. <laughs> right. True. So it'll process it more easily, but he brings up a very good point. My screen is calibrated. Um, your computers, you've probably never even thought to calibrate it. It probably has factory settings, which makes it look bright and vibrant and pretty. It doesn't mean it's true colors. You can get free softwares online that calibrate your screen that make the colors more true. Thanks for bringing that up. I never even thought to tell people that. So I've always calibrated mine. Uh, what's really funny is I have two different branded monitors at home. Each one calibrated looks different, even after being calibrated. So keep that in mind. Um, what you see on your screen is never going to be 100% what you're going to get ever, because they're all different. So. <coughs> <laughs> um, if no one could hear that, he said that um, basically you have, there's proofing programs you can use um, that can help, but it's never going to be 100%. Um, but next up is formats. <laughs> Who here has ever had files printed anywhere? Great. Um, who's ever taken a picture with a camera and had to pull up that file that had the weird file format? The TIFF or the RAWs? Okay. So depending on <coughs> your software, where you're printing, and how you got your files depends on your file format and depends what file format is best for you. Uh, when it comes to things like the Game Crafter and other print-on-demand sites, PNGs are my go-to. What lossless compression means is that when you save that file, every single pixel is saved exactly as you made it. Also, it's red, green, blue. So it's not that CMYK that you want for printing. It's always red, green, blue. So it's a little, the colors are always going to be a little different than what's going to be printed. JPEGs, lossy compression, they can be both red, green, blue, and CMYK. However, when you save a JPEG, you have to save it at its maximum settings. And even then, it guesses on what all the information is to make it look like what it should but it doesn't necessarily mean it's always accurate. It kind of fills in the blanks to make your file size smaller. A way to get around that, saving it large, and also never editing that JPEG once you, sa once you save it. If you edit a PNG, you can edit that PNG 100 times, save that PNG, never use the base file, it'll always look the same. You edit that JPEG 10 times, you're gonna have what's called artifacting. I'm gonna show you guys an example, and I did a very exaggerated example, so just so you guys know. And I also zoomed way in. Uh, so this one closest to me uh, is just an oversized PNG. And the one on the right is a JPEG I opened a couple times. And it, I edited it a couple times, and I reopened it and edited it. So you can see how it got more artifacting. And it had a color. It had a light outline that I didn't have in there. So that's why JPEGs can be a problem. They're usually really great for web. They're really great for a lot of things. I wouldn't use them for printing if you plan on ever editing it again without the base file. <coughs> but again, this is a very exaggerated example. I forcefully made that artifact. Um, but it's just a, it's kind of like worst case scenario if in a month you want to edit it. And you're like, oh no, I forgot to save the base file. So that's JPEGs. SVGs, they're really only important for the Game Crafter. These are their file formats for cutting with their laser. They're a vector. They're always really tiny and small, even though they're supposed to be in this big thing. Um, and they're generally just paths on a file. Um, you can make them images, but they're not really used for printing. Uh, PDF. Yeah? Are they used for like making a font? 
Yes, they are, because that's how I made my custom font for Component Studio. I used SVGs. <clears throat> good call. Um, so yeah, if you use Component Studio, SVGs are good for your custom fonts. Yeah. No. There can be if you tell it to lose it. Right, but if you're doing maximum. Yeah, if you're using maximum and it does like, a, when you save it, it's like, do you want to do any information left? You can hit like yes or no. Just always say yes. Make sure it saves all the information you want. You never want to lose any of that information. Um, <clears throat> PDFs. This is what every printer in China uses. These have all the information they need to print your file and any program can read these. Well, almost any program can read PDFs. These are going to be what hold multiple images that are going to be imported into that China printer. Now, in this case, or in one of my cases, for PN PDFs, I had to have 1,000 cards in one PDF, and then one separate PDF for the back of the cards. So PDFs are important. You have to learn your way around them, and I'm going to go over that a bit as well on saving them, what saving them looks like. <clears throat> and then again, always in CMYK. Do, do, do. I hit the wrong button. There we go. All right, so I'm going to go over a couple things, uh, kind of going from start to finish on a couple of files. I'm going to show you guys how to do one for the Game Crafter and then how to do one for someone like Panda. <coughs> so, like always, go to my desktop. So, I have a the Game Crafters template, just regular PNG. So, I'm going to take that and we're going to open that in our Photoshop. Now, most programs can drag and drop. If they can't drag and drop, you just file and open. I open a bridge. No one pay attention to that. <laughs> there we go. So you just file, open it, and find your file, select it, open it. Now, what I do for the GameCrafters formats, uh, I always use PNGs just because they open in any program. You can do like the Photoshop file because that'll open in most image editors, but not all of them. PNGs should open in any image editor you possibly find. <clears throat> so I'm just do a couple magic here real quick. There we go. So for me, I always get rid of all the information because I don't need it. And I get rid of this because I don't use borders. And I basically just kind of cut, cut it all out, most of it. Apparently, I missed a bit. Does GameCrafter also have a duplicate template in the default? Is that just to compare and compare to just the top line for each page? Is it to size? Yeah. Oh, I did not know it was to size. It's basically the same thing as just PNG, it's also a PNG file, but it doesn't have a white background while it's in the file. Neat. Well, there you go. So, if anybody didn't hear that, uh, Zovus or uh, Marson <laughs> said that uh, the GameCrafter has print overlays that you can download that are just this bit. Uh, without all the white that I just cut out. Well, that's a neat thing. Um, I was at a white background. And then from here, this is where you will design your card. So let's say I want a box and I want it to be green. That's an ugly green. That's all right. I'm just gonna do something weird. <laughs> like we were talking about, text tools are important in your design programs. And then when you're saving your files, always hide your templates. That's important. They will print whatever you give them. If you have templates, they will print your templates. So when saving for the Game Crafter, it's usually really simple. Control, Shift, S, or Save As. PNG. Now, the reason PNG is an option when I save is because I never converted my image huh, to CMYK. I've been working in red, green, blue. So I made number one mistake that you never will make, never work in red, green, blue. Always work in CMYK. So let's go ahead and we won't merge them. See how the color changed? If I had sent that in with that image in red, green, blue, do you think I would have gotten the color I thought I was going to get? That changed a lot, right? So that's important. You'll notice over here I still have this color selected, that bright, ugly green. If I try to use that green, it doesn't, it's not that green anymore. 
That green no longer exists in CMYK. So in Photoshop, does that change You can if I open it. Yeah. So you can find, you can still find bright colors. But just keep in mind that that's why you always want to start in CMYK. Um, but, so Game Crafter, now watch when I try to save. There's a more PNG option. So this is why another thing I want to teach you guys is always save your primary file. You never want to lose your edited, unedited file with all the bits. So first we're going to save just the basic file. Maximum compatibility, it's always important. Once that's done, then you can always change back over to red, green, blue. Now let's see how much this changes. Did it change? Right, because that color exists in red, green, blue, but not the other way around. So now my color that I want is going to be there versus the color I wanted that's never going to be there. So now you can save your file. There we go. Now we have a file. Now we have a file that goes right onto the Game Crafters website. Now, I, I converted it, right? Now it's red, green, blue. What do I do? I just convert it back. Because now that we know it goes both ways, I don't worry about losing any of my images or any of my colors. There we go. Uh, it will if it wasn't originally made in CMYK. So the, right now we just saved a PNG in red, green, blue that we made in CMYK. Yeah? Sure. It's a great example, and for our people on stream, what he was saying is the reason why um, the color in red, green, blue can't be made in CMYK is there's more colors in red, green, blue than there are in CMYK. So it doesn't get converted. And a big reason for that is how printing works. Um, red, green, blue is made for screens that are backlit. They can be bright and vibrant because there's actual light there. Printers overlay colors. From a very light pastel, they keep overlaying, and that's how a printer works. They overlay color, they can never take away color. So, uh, but now that we have a PNG that we saved, that works directly on the Game Crafter. We did it in CMYK, so it'll look the way we want to when it's printed. For Panda, very similar, you start in CMYK, but this time when we go to save it, make sure our color mode is correct on CMYK. Sorry, my hand's like covering it up, so it looks a little funny on my end. So we're in CMYK, we're going to control shift save. And what I like about using programs like Photoshop or InDesign and things like that is the settings they allow for your PDF are, there are so many you don't have to do with them, but they come in handy. So in this case, when I save as a PDF, I get a ton of options. I have a preset for long pack because they told me the exact settings they want on their PDFs and you just apply them and you go. It's that simple. You find their design guide, you ask them what they want, they tell you, you change it. The big things that change, generally, it gets rid of compression, which compression can change your output to something not great, and it converts to their color profile. So Panda was, there you go, we'll do long pack. So there's long packs. So we can convert it to that one. Now, the reason I convert it in PDF here instead of on the base file is because I'm using other people's printers. Because normally, I can just go in and convert it in here. Right now, it's currently on long pack because um, I was recently <laughs> using long pack. But, so you can always convert your entire document to one, but if you're using multiple printers, I recommend changing it at save. So if you're starting with a game crafter, then you're moving to Panda, or you're going to drive through games, then you're going to long pack. Changing these at save is usually your best bet. So then your final output is what you need it to be. Any questions on that? I know it's a lot to take in.
you set it at thirty hours. I mean, you gotta have it set to something as you're working, right? Right. So the color profiles are more about the final measurements. So you're like, these are the colors I have, but I want my final end result to I'm trying to think of the best way to explain it. It's like, so right now, let's say this green on my screen is a one and that red is a two. For the game crafters, that might be a three and a four. And for, and for long pack, it might be a five and a six. So while this one and two is here, when I save it, I tell it to be a five and a six. So that way they know the differences in the colors. It's more about how their printer reads it and it reads it as data, it doesn't necessarily read it as color. So you're basically telling their printer, I want these colors to be these colors. So what you start at isn't necessarily important as long as it's in the right color mode, so CMYK. Does that help at all? A little bit? <laughs> um, let's see, where were we? Right. All right, so in conclusion, I think I'm going a little, told you it wasn't gonna take up a full hour. You guys were supposed to ask more questions. <laughs> um, so in conclusion, this is mostly just to help you know what the people you're hiring are doing behind the scenes. Because if you don't know this, at least the basics, you're gonna get lost along the way and you aren't gonna be as much in that process as you wanna be. Now I know a lot of people sometimes are like, I want you to take care of it, I don't want anything to do with it. I've had that situation. I've literally had to talk to manufacturers for people. But if you're in that, you know what you're printing. You know what's getting printed. You know what's getting printed correctly. So that way you can take responsibility for your game because you know you want it to turn out perfect. So that's kind of what I want to go over. Anybody want me to go over anything again? Want me to bring anything back up? It's a lot to take in. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so they should have these already on their computer. Um, if a manufacturer provided you one, just send them the same file they sent you or tell them where to download it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Um, if, you, if all the cards don't have the same backspace, they're different, how do you end up showing them off when you Oh, sure. So the question was, is when you have a lot of files, um, for example, that thousand card game I have, how are those files sent to the printers? Um, how are they read? How are they kind of dealt with? Um, and then as well as how are the backs of those cards dealt with? Um, in that case, what it was was I did both. I, they had a template, or not a template, a prototype printed from the Game Crafter, which was literally a file for every single card and a file for every single back that was needed. I think there was like one main back and then a couple different colored variations, but it was literally a thousand card images. I have a five terabyte external hard drive for that, for that purpose. Um, my Dropbox is full because of that. <laughs> so it, um, it, it was a ton of files, but um, the Game Crafters bulk upload really helps with that. I just had to, you have to wait and you have to re-upload. So that took a while, but when places like Panda or Longpack is way easier, they all get saved in one file. So you're basically sending every, you know how when you open a PDF document and you have page one, page two, page three? Page one was one card, page two was one card, page 999 was a card. So there was a card on every page. And then what they do is they take that, they import it into whatever they use, and they send me back a giant sheet this, like the sheet they put in their printer, they sent me back an image of that with all the cards laid out. So I could go through and make sure all the cards look good. And that's, that's kind of how they did it. And these are like, this is a proof. That's your digital proofs you get when you send stuff to Panda. They're like, here's your digital proofs. And it's all your stuff laid out. And that's a good way to be like, There's, that color is weird. That, that color's off. Why is that one card weird? Or, so that's what they do. So you can send them basically like one or two files and they break it all down for you. Um, where the game crafter is a little bit more manual, it's a little more do-it-yourself, get your elbows dirty, um, single files. Which is where Component Studio is nice because it'll do it for you. It'll just upload them all for you, which is a big help. 
Anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> it's a great question. Uh, is JT in here? <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure why. I, I originally believed it was for um, ease of new users because a lot of people are like, I can just take an image and put it in there. And now this image, you know, because most people know how to make an image, but not necessarily a PDF or all the extra steps. So I think it was just more for being easy. Because um, if you use a site, let's say, example, Vistaprint, where I print my business cards, you just upload an image. You don't need a special file format. You don't need anything. They just they do it from there. I think they were going for ease of use, but they still have to print it like a printer, so they convert it to CMYK when they get it. Um, it's a weird process, um, but that's my understanding of it. That's kind of how I think about it. I don't know their original reason. Uh, I could like summon JT and maybe ask him, but. <laughs> No. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. You said you can. You recommend brightening up your image. Yes. Um, yes, and that's just because of the conversion they do. Um, I've noticed prints really dark, um, even compared to some other printers. I mean, all printers are going to print darker because your screen is backlit. It's, it's bright colors, it's vibrant. Printers are not bright and vibrant. So always brighten your images more than you think they might need to be. <laughs> um, what, is there a certain uh, rule of thumb you have? What the, what the adjustment layer is that you put on before yeah. you export? Yeah, absolutely. I'll show you guys. Um, I actually have, I have a cheat in Photoshop, but I'll show you how I kind of break it down. Um, I have, in Photoshop, I have this thing called Actions, which I basically preset all my settings, and then I just hit Play, and it applies them. But normally, I'll go up here. Let me make my image. There we go. So this is what I meant by color correction, is most softwares have this. Some aren't as great. But first, I go into my hue and saturation. I usually, depending on where you're printing, with the Game Crafters, you can actually decrease your saturation, because their stuff's usually a bit more vibrant. So I decrease saturation. And then I go here, and I go into my brightness. And I do this a little bit by eye, because I've printed a lot of stuff with them. I'm going to show you guys an example here in a moment of a, a guide I use. Um, and then I'll usually up my brightness a bit. And I'll adjust my contrast needed. Sometimes you need less contrast or more contrast, depending on how deep you want your blacks on a card. If it's a really dark and shadowy card, maybe you want more contrast. And that's usually it. Usually it's just adjusting them a bit so you're, they're going to look better. Let me pull up an example here. I do a lot of it by eye. Usually, my, my thing is usually 10 to 20 points. Uh, the thing is based on points. I usually go 10 to 20 points depending on the card. I've had a game where it was a very trippy game, a lot of bright, vibrant colors. I didn't adjust that very much at all, because anything more, and it would have been like blinding. Um, where, but I've had games that are dark where I had to like through the roof, brighten them. Uh, for saturation, usually I just go down like three to five points, um, but your brightness is 10 to 20 points. Usually you want to crank that up unless you have an already very bright card. That's usually what I end up doing. Um, but it is varied based on your card. There's a lot that goes with just having a good eye for it. But I'm going to show you guys something here. Proofs. There's an image I took that might help. Is it big? Okay. When you say a page, do you mean like just do like a large game map and put it on there? Uh, for our streamers, he's saying print proofs are great. Even just like a big play mat with all your cards on it, so you can see what it looks like, is always a good idea, and that's true. I mean, if you can look at your, what your cards are going to look like cheaply, 
that's the best thing you could ever want because then you're going to know how they're going to print. Nope, should be very similar. Okay, it will be. Yeah, from my understanding, they use very much of the same stock, and they use the same co uh, coating, the clay coating, unless you're using UV. Um, this is something I took a while back. I was doing a test printing of multiple printers. These are hex colors. A JT was talking a bit about these in Component Studio. This is what his fonts use. Um, so these are all hex colors. See how bright and vibrant and crazy they are? This is what they look like if you print them. Nowhere near as fluorescent. Well, the yellow is a little fluorescent, but they're, they're more neut neutral, they're dull. And this is me not changing them whatsoever. So this is what they print over for. This is on the Game Crafters website. If you type in color and click on color profile, where their color profile is for download, this is where you can see, kind of compare them. So first of all, if you're seeing colors like this, you're in the wrong color mode. <laughs> this is all hex colors. These are red, green, blues, or that RGB. You're in the wrong color mode, but it gives you an idea of how bright, vibrant colors actually print. So just keep in mind, like your blacks are more of a darker gray, and your, you know, this is a like a medium gray that prints to a dark gray, um, which actually brings up something I forgot to tell you guys. In CMYK, who knows what that K stands for? Black. Right? Okay. Key. key. There you go. It stands for key. So what key is, is it's, it's that black cartridge in your printer. But what most people don't know is, remember when JT was telling you about the mix of all those colors, makes that black, that nice dark black, um, it's an FFFFFF, the bot, or in this case all zeros. Um, that is not the black your printer wants you to use. Your printer in China wants you to use key, which is the lack of every other color. So all zeros across the board. If you have any other color, so red, green, blue is light, and this is gonna go a bit into color theory. Um, when light mixes, it creates black, right? So all colors in red, green, blue on a screen make black, or in this case, paint. Sorry, all colors of lack of colors make white. But if you mix paint together, you get black. Where in this case, all lack of colors in CMYK is gonna give you black. So you don't want any other color mixed in with that. If you do, and your printer has any sort of print drift, you're gonna have weird white outlines. Have you guys, does anybody know what overprint is? <laughs> um, so what overprint is, is it's basically, um, the colors when they print, they overlap. We were talking about color overlapping. If you overlap something and then they try to apply black to that, it cuts out anything underneath it, as if it doesn't exist. So if it slips, you're gonna have a white there, because that black took out all the color. It's weird, yeah? Yes, I know of it. I've never had the issue come up where I had to worry about it. Um, I've never had a printer tell me you have too much black coverage. Um, it's usually because I try to avoid using black at all costs because it's annoying. If you do it in a program like Photoshop, you have to specifically make sure you have um, the key black, which is there's no CMYK, no yellow, no magenta in it, so all zeros, 100% black, and then you have to set it to multiply as a layer effect. Super weird and convoluted, just so it prints correctly, where other programs do it automatically. Uh, Component Studio has an option for overprint. Um, if you ever use something to hide something in Component Studio, that black shows through no matter what. It's really weird. Um, but it's annoying. I try to avoid black in my designs as much as possible um, because of this reason. Um, because if I use Photoshop for something, it just doesn't work. But basically, always make sure that when you're looking at your black, and I'll show you guys here, when you're looking at your blacks, <coughs> we're in CMYK. My black should be doo -doo -doo, 0, 0, 0, 100. This is your pure black. It's going to look grayer than your normal uh, rich black, which is the mixture of all the colors. It looks grayer. It's not. It's darker when it's printed. That's how you know if you have the wrong black. If it's like, oh, this is so deep and pretty, it's a beautiful black, you have the wrong black. It should look gray and muted. <laughs> um, this is usually only important if you have a lot of black, which is usually your text. Um, if you have a graphic designer, they know how to overprint. I won't worry too much about it as long as they're doing that. But keep in mind, 
the blacks you're using, your printer will call you out on it. Oh, we're out of time. Oh, oh my God, I went an hour. No, go ahead. What's up? Okay, it's called Affinity. Designer. Affinity Designer is an alternative to Illustrator that's only like 50 bucks one time payment. 50 bucks one time payment. I think it has a free trial. Um, they also do an alternative to Photoshop. They just released Publisher. I haven't tried that. I will have to check them out. Yeah. I'm always good at alternative programs. Um, I, kn I refuse to do any illustrations in Photoshop since I discovered Clip Studio Paint, which is also just 50 bucks one time. So, I'm all for alternate programs that don't break my budget. <laughs> All right, thank you.